commercialized prayers. For most men, all that remains of the religious faith of childhood are a few conditioned behavioral reflexes, such as a love of truth, the enjoyment of honest hard work, or a pleasure in non-freedom. From the moral point of view, everyone should have the right to lie. It helps us to stave off society's often too bold attempts to supervise us and thus minimize our own personal fight for existence. The disadvantage of lying is that if everyone does it, it loses its usefulness. If anyone is gullible enough to believe something that is not true, he must himself love the truth and assume a similar love in others. Consequently, a lie becomes a luxury. It has rarity value. The rarity value has to be maintained by incessant denigration in the interest of liars. Therefore, it is important that women teach men love of truth, for only if he loves truth is she able to afford the luxury of lying. For contemporary society to survive at all, men must believe in truth. They do the work, and no practical, i.e. logical, system can function on lies. In the highly developed system of contemporary society where all labor is divided, each man must be able to work with and rely on the other. If men were to take to lying when the moment seemed opportune, say in matters such as train schedules, freighters' capacities, or the amount of fuel left in an airplane's tank, the effect on our commercial system would be disastrous. Within a very short time, there would be complete chaos. Women, however, can lie with a clear conscience. They are not involved in the process of work, so their lies will harm only one person, usually the husband. And if it is not discovered, it is not a lie at all. It is feminine guile. The only crime that does not come under this heading is physical unfaithfulness, which a man will not forgive. As a man has been conditioned by women's self-abasement, it seems natural to him that she should use guile, weak and dependent creature that she is, as the only way in which she can hope to guide this powerful, sex-obsessed giant, this unfortunate, wretched animal. It is no wonder that women, having proved guile a success, talk quite openly about it. You will read about it in one of their favorite media, women's magazines. Mothers hand it out as advice to their daughters. Why not? It is quite justified, since all of their comfort depends on it. For they are frequently forced to exploit the same man, first mother's husband, and later, perhaps, if the mother lives under the same roof, the daughter's husband. After all, their whole future comfort depends on whether he comes to heal. Of course, women would never openly forbid a man to lie, they simply associate lying with repugnance. This is easily done by means of the chosen system of religious faith which connects lying with the idea of fictional punishment or by a kind of personal magic. If a mother tells her child not to lie to her because it is bad, he will automatically have a guilty conscience if he does. She does not even need to be specific about this badness the child believes her implicitly, is dependent upon her, and relies upon him what she tells him. He believes she would never lie. This is nonsense, of course, for mothers constantly tell their children the most barefaced lies. The same magic is involved when, later on, a woman convinces her husband that unfaithfulness is something squalid and wretched. You must never deceive me or if she happens to be one of those tolerant wives. It's not so bad if you deceive me, but you must never, under any circumstances, leave me. A generous woman, and he will obey her order, for such it is, without doubting its justification. Once in a while he will sleep with another woman, but he will rarely leave his wife, although her admission of boundless indifference should be a signal to him to leave her at once. Only one circumstance in a man's life will ever make him tell a lie, and that is when he, as a result of pent-up desire, has slept with another woman. 
although he dearly loves his own wife. He is so afraid of the possible consequences, she might do the same thing herself, that he will suffer the most agonizing pangs of conscience rather than admit the truth. But if he has merely smashed up the car and maybe even killed someone in the process, if he has behaved treacherously towards someone else or taken a day off from work, he would rather clear his conscience and tell her. A woman's reactions are exactly the opposite. She will keep quiet about absolutely everything except her interest in another man or that man's interest in her. If two or three other men are attracted, she will use the situation to her advantage by advertising it at once. She tells her husband just to make sure he knows there is someone else to look after her if necessary. This alone is enough to shape a man up and increase his rate of output immediately. We have already mentioned man's desire to be unfree. This leads to religious fervor and prayer, a fact which is still true today. For pop songs are only a modified version of childhood prayers. The god of former days has been conveniently replaced by the goddess, woman who is right at hand. Man's happiness really does depend on woman. Even the content of the prayers remains virtually the same. The longing to submit oneself to a higher power, a plea for her to listen to him and be merciful or simple idealization. It doesn't matter whether one says, So take my hands, or And thy right hand shall become me, or Fly me to the moon. It all amounts to the same in the end. Some modern records do still praise the old god, but only the choice of words shows they are not directly referring to women. Thou who makest all things grow. Prayers and religious songs, i.e. prayers to music, ease existential anxiety. They appeal to a superego on whose every whim happiness depends. This superego allows us to relax and accept life, and frees us from the pursuit of happiness, for everything lies in the hands of our God. As man grows older, his fear increases. He has come to realize why it is justified, and increasingly his wish to let go grows too. This need to relax for a few moments at least, and to commit himself to this almighty power. In the old days, intellectual men used to work out their fears by writing love poems, which took the place of prayer and calmed them down. Nowadays, this form of adoration has become superfluous. The current supply of pop songs, the dark longings of men, naturally commercialized at their own expense, increases, and their lyrics, for example those of the Beatles, satisfy the most sophisticated of tastes. There are, of course, also some bits sung specifically in praise of men. Those few are usually songs made popular by a male singer and then sung by a woman. In general, however, women only sing hymns to love, which, since men need them for love, is almost the same as singing hymns to themselves. Still, at some stage, they discovered that they could sing their own praises without being too obvious. And ever since, women have ceased to worry. They praise their own magnificence, their fickleness, their cruelty, and the self-complacency with which they give themselves to men, whether to save or destroy them. When Marlene Dietrich sang in The Blue Angel that love is my world and my nature and nothing else, all I can do is make love and that's all, and men flutter around me like moths and burn up and I can't help it. She was expressing just these sentiments. If women can think of themselves as divine, just how divine they must be. In real life, of course, women are far more subtle in their exploitation of the male sex than in that film. They don't ruin men immediately. They are quite prepared to take a whole lifetime over it. After all, who is going to kill the goose that lays so many golden eggs? That is why men were able to laugh over the wretched figure of Professor Unrath instead of recognizing in him a portrait of themselves. Think of Nancy Sinatra's great hit, which says the same in a slightly different way. These boots are made for walking, 
And that's just what they'll do. One of these days, these boots are going to walk all over you. A hit indeed, for it satisfies man's need and longing for a cruel goddess on the one hand, and a woman's claim to omnipotence on the other. <laughs>